Hey guys, it's Gary from Pop Culture My Field, and I'm here to talk about The Mandalorian. in advance I'm, I'm really sick I'm fighting a cold uh, this is um, almost uh, eight days uh, of just being solidly building up and now I'm starting to get to the coughing phase so okay I guess I can sum up from episode one to now so chapter one each episode of the chapter uh, chapter one is simply called the Mandalorian second one is called the child and the third one is called the sin and of course this new one today is called Sanctuary. Now, to sum up one through three, basically the story is um, we meet the Mandalorian. He is going to collect a bounty because that's what he's at. He's a bounty hunter. He's part of the guild. And he goes off to this planet and discovers Baby Yoda. And that is the end of episode two when he gets there and finds his kid. Uh, and of course, in episode three, he takes the baby back to deliver his bounty. Uh, feels guilty, like it's a sin, uh, and he goes back and takes the baby. And of course, doing this, he breaks the rules of the, the guild, committing another sin, and he's going to have to pay for it. And by the end, it ends up in an amazing shootout battle, whatever you want to call it. Don't want to tell you what it is, watch the show. I don't want to spoil it. But Baby Yoda is like, <laughs> he's the greatest thing to probably come along in a while. Oh, and I don't want to forget the fact that uh, there's a great little Easter egg in it that has something to do with the plot that's going to unravel as we go forward, is that uh, the scientist uh, that uh, is waiting for the bounty, the Yoda baby, has the Camino patch on his shoulder. So obviously this, this has to do somehow with this, this baby has been cloned or they're trying to clone it, that it may be just one of the species from Yoda and not actually a baby Yoda. So we'll be finding out because George Lucas has made it a point to never allow the species to be named. That was something he's kept a secret all this time, and they're still keeping it a secret, and maybe that's something that's going to be unveiled in this, in this series. So we'll see. In order to explain my joy with this show, I need to point out the fact that there's um, this this negative side of things. And, and of course, I do consider myself a, a polite member of the um, fandom menace. Uh, I'm a lot like John over at uh, Entertainment Hacker, which is why we, we probably talk a lot. And it's because um, I agree with Gary Beekler. I, I agree with everybody in the fandom menace, really, in context. But <clears throat> I think they tend to get a little negative, in my opinion, overly negative. I think there's a lot of room for criticism, and they're right for that criticism. Uh, you know, Doomcock, all of them. I watch all those guys. Uh, but I do think that uh, we tend to get a little heavy-handed, and I tend to want to be a more thoughtful side of things. I've always been a very thoughtful person. Um, so I, I want to put out there more of a positive vibe from our point of view. And uh, so I... I don't like Brian Johnson. I really don't. I think that he's a cretin. I don't think he's a very good person. I think he's really um, kind of a shitty person when it comes to Star Wars. I don't know how he is with people outside of uh, fandom. Maybe he's a good guy. I like his previous films, but it's going to be hard for me to enjoy any of his films because of uh, how much of his ass he's shown to the legacy fans and how much he shit on, on legacy characters. So with that said, you know, um, I don't want to go too far into it, but Lucasfilm and Disney, Disney in particular, because um, they have had to take control of Star Wars. Uh, Kathleen Kennedy hasn't been in charge since the failure of uh, Solo. And uh, um, they've really fumbled the ball. The, the, the saga films are, are doomed. They're just doomed. They, you know, they're going to make a billion dollars. I mean, if you made a billion dollars, that means it would be a success. No, Lucasfilms does not, I mean, uh, Disney does not consider $1 billion for a film a success. They do not. They spent $4.5 billion to buy Lucasfilm. That was 2.5 more than they wanted to spend. And, uh, and I think it was the friendship between Iger and Lucas that got him the additional $2.5 billion. And so far, 
with the money spent on these films, they've really not turned the profit. With the failure of uh, uh, Star Wars Galaxy at Disneyland and Disney World, uh, and with the um, uh, loss in sales for Star Wars toys, I mean, it's a complete loss at this point. Um, they're questioning whether their purchase was worth it, but they kind of messed it up themselves because the only people who really buy those toys are legacy fans and uh, the ones who really put a dent in the market. I mean, they're going to sell the kids, period. But where they make their, their lucrative side of the business is with collectors because uh, we don't just buy one thing. We buy multiple things. And when we go see a Star Wars film, we go see it multiple times. And they're making films that we don't like and that we're not even bothering to see sometimes even once. Uh, we're just, they're losing the fan base. And that was not a smart move. I know they've got some sort of long range plan because Disney's a smart company. But uh, in the short run, they've lost uh, billions of dollars uh, in this deal. Lost billions of dollars. We say it again, lost billions of dollars. And where they succeed is with Disney Plus. And the smart move was to put Dave Filoni and John Favreau on this because um, uh, Filoni in particular is a Star Wars favorite by fans. So his involvement with the Clone Wars and even with uh, Rebels, um, he's a beloved creator for Star Wars when it comes to the canon stuff. And, uh, and he's shown a great deal of passion and the fans appreciate that. They love that passion. And Favreau is also a very impassioned fan of Star Wars. Uh, his connection to uh, the canon as having played uh, a Mandalorian in the animated series, um, he has that connection. And that he brought George Lucas on the set uh, means a lot to us fans. And don't get me wrong, I love George Lucas, but I felt his time in, in charge um, was really put to the test when he decided to write the prequel series rather than bringing someone else to write. Because he's, I've always said this, he's a terrible writer. Uh, he's a great story creator. He's great at writing the basic story outlines, but he should not be in charge of dialogue because he cannot write dialogue worth of crap. And, I mean, the original actors, uh, you know, Carrie Fisher, Harrison Ford, and Mark Hamill used to make fun of that. They're like, you can write these words, but you can't say them. And uh, so I really felt that um, bringing him back in was a nice measure by John Favreau and... Um, you know, and I know that Kathleen Kennedy looks so uncomfortable in a lot of those photos where you see her on the set. Uh, Lucas does not. He looks like he's enjoying himself. And I think that they stay true to Lucas's original vision of how things were. And that's why this show is going over well. And I understand a lot of fans are still taking issue with it, but I think they're wrong. I really do. Uh, I think that having a problem with um, The Mandalorian is uh, you're looking at it the wrong way. This is really legitimately good Star Wars. It has the heart again. And that's the thing that J.J. Um, uh, Abrams, Kathleen Kennedy ripped out of it when they started making the Disney Star Wars trilogy is uh, they ripped the heart out of it. And uh, I don't want to go into a long diatribe about this. We'll just end it there. And uh, just simply to say that um, uh, I think that Mandalorian puts Star Wars back on track, right back where it needs to be. Lucasfilm, we come back to this other thing, Disney Plus. We heard The Mandalorian was coming. Some of us were upset, myself included, that it wasn't a Boba Fett story. But I heard uh, Dave uh, uh, Filoni's explanation. And you know what? And I saw what they said within the series. And George Lucas was part of this, that that uh, Jango and Boba Fett were not true Mandalorians. And I, I respect that because it's actually part of canon, that they are not true Mandalorians. Um it's not even clear if there ever were Mandalorians, but um, I, I respect what they're going for here. And um, Dave Filoni felt, as he worked with Favreau, that um, that this was the logical way to go. That um, basically the Mandalorian 
is a true Mandalorian, a foundling, which if you don't know what a foundling is, a foundling is um, a culture that was attacked by anyone, including even the Mandalorians, and they would find children and they would adopt these children, uh, the strong children. They wouldn't, uh, they would likely, they were very similar to um, um, Spartans in that they, they looked for strong, not weak. And they would probably leave weak children. They might help them, but they, they would not adopt them. But when they find a, a child with strong will, they would adopt them in, and they would in turn become Mandalorian, which is why Mandalorians aren't really one culture, you know? And, you know, a lot of people were like, uh, well, they have to be these, um, uh, like the actor who, who played Jango Fett, they have to all be Polynesian. And it's like, no, 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 no. Um, you could have many different cultures and they don't need, need to be even the same species. They could be humanoid, not human. So Mandalorians are very specifically um, uh, more of a, it's almost like a philosophy or a religion. Uh, the way they live their lives so we get to meet this character which we don't have a name for him he's just simply the mandalorian and in episode one simply called chapter one or the mandalorian uh, we see that he's a bounty hunter one of the best if not the best in the, in the galaxy very respected and feared and he's part of a guild and he's collecting and he gets paid and he's not able to get paid because now that the galactic empire has been uh defeated uh, the, the galaxy under the New Republic is kind of in disarray, especially in these, the Outer Rim. So it's hard to make a living. And uh, money, it, it's very similar to what happened after the Civil War with money in the South. You know, um, the money, the Confederate dollars were worthless. So that's sort of what's going on here with the galactic uh, imperial money is worthless. And he doesn't want that. He doesn't want those credits. He wants something of, of uh, actual value. So we find out that uh, during the purge uh, with Mandalore, that uh, much of the Mandalorian metal was uh, taken by the Empire, pirated, and uh, used for their own gain. And he's getting some of it back with the Imperial symbol on it. And uh, he goes to take this job and gets paid with that with metal and it's precious and he has some of it melted into a shoulder plate and the rest of it goes to feed uh, the foundlings and the other members of the um, mandalorian culture that are living there underground and they can apparently only come out of ground one at a time um, in order to hide how many of them are left because of what happened during the purge so they live in secret and i like this this is really good lore coming in here and it's straight out of canon and, uh, and when I hear that Star Wars fans are ha taking issue with the show, I'm like, why? This is part of the canon that you loved. You know, this comes from uh, the Clone Wars. This comes from um, Star Wars itself, George Lucas. You know, what, what's not to love about this? He's not writing it, for goodness sake. You know, he's, he's just helping develop these stories. Lucas did. And, of course, Favreau had Lucas on the set to help with some of the stuff they were doing. And, and I think it was really good that he has that connection with George Lucas. And of course, Favreau was in the, or was it the Rebels or was it in, uh, he played a Mandalorian. Uh, I know that he played it. It was either in uh, Rebels or in uh, the Clone Wars. But either way it goes, they're following what was set up by Lucas. And uh, the show really, in my opinion, is the one saving grace for Lucasfilm right now. And I don't think Kathleen Kennedy had anything to do with this from the look of it. Uh, which is why we've been hearing the rumblings that Favreau, Feige, and uh, Dave Filoni may be the future of Star Wars. And they should run it as the Holy Trinity. The three of them should run Star Wars. Uh, and different aspects of the control jobs, with one, Feige probably right at the top, with Favreau and Filoni in charge of everything that they're putting out. And with Feige overseeing it, because he's really good at this. And I don't think he has to, Keith and I talked about it on the episode, that uh, he does not have to leave um, Marvel to do this. Um, I think it was a brilliant idea, and I hope that this is what they actually do. But let's get into the fourth episode. We now have, at the end of the third episode, the introduction of Baby Yoda. And um, I love this character. Uh, as a dad, as a single dad, I raised my daughter by myself. I have a very maternal 
instinct. Uh, even when I was in the army as a combat medic or as a paramedic in, in civilian life, I, I had a great maternal feeling towards people, towards children, and I always want to help and I want to uh, nurture and do all those things. And so I see Baby Yoda and I'm just like all gooey inside and, um, and I want one for Christmas. So we meet that baby at the end. Now, episodes one through three, people keep saying that this has this Western thing and they, they bring up um, the spaghetti Westerns and all that. And I'm like, yeah, that's there. But there's something else here too, which is uh, a great homage to the traditional samurai films, which is really what the Mandalorian is in his own way. He's, he's a lone samurai called a ronin. And in this one, uh, in episode three or chapter three, the 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 sin, he is. Uh, it's basically they're taking straight from Lone Wolf and Cub, visually and uh, contextually. It's 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 very much Lone Wolf and Cub. And I got a feeling most of this series is going to be a little mix of Lone Wolf and, and Cub. And then we get into chapter four, which is clearly. Anybody who knows there's, you know, who's a cinephile like me that knows their film history knows that this is um, a new adaptation in its own way of The Seventh Samurai. It was adapted in America as The Magnificent Seven and then years later by Disney itself as A Bug's Life. So this is the Star Wars adaptation of Seventh Samurai. And, uh, and of course, we don't have Seventh Samurai, we just have two. And I think it's interesting what they ended up doing here is that they uh, introduced uh, the Gina Carano character, who's a former shock trooper, um, that after the dissolution of the Empire, kind of became a ronin of her own and hid out on this planet. She's uh, uh, probably wanted. He wasn't after her. She thought he was. And uh, so there's a great little fight between the two. But they end up becoming friends in the episode. And because they're so short, these episodes, they're, they're only uh, 45 minutes long, 50 minutes. And so we, we don't get to get enough character development and story arc. And so this film or episode sort of has a um, shortcoming in that department because it rushes things. So it rushes these bonds. And um, I was annoyed by the romantic rush in this story. Don't get me wrong, I like the romantic aspect. It's just simply, it was it felt rushed. I felt like they needed to show more time had passed before this kind of emotional reaction of one character to another. Um, uh, asking about, you know, do you ever take your helmet off came so quickly that I felt it was not cringy or anything. It just felt really awkward and clumsy. Uh, I felt like it needed to be something said later on after they'd known each other for a while. And uh, so um, that, and there's one little clip near the end where some kids wave at, at, at uh, Yoda, Baby Yoda, and Baby Yoda doesn't wave back, and I thought that was a missed moment. But once again, the show was executively produced by John Favreau and Dave Filoni, and it was um, written by John Favreau. Um, solid writing, except for a couple of things. Um, one, one other thing I disliked in it in the writing was when he considers leaving the baby Yoda there in this village. And I'm like, well, why would you consider doing that? I mean, you've been there now. You know you're on the radar. You even, he even says at one point that they're going to be, you know, we've made too much noise here. Uh, people are going to come looking. And then he considers leaving the baby. And I'm like, that made no sense. And then, of course, you get a payoff for that later. It's like... But at the same time, that shouldn't have even been posed. If it was going to be posed, it should have been posed earlier in the episode, uh, before they make the big noise. Um, I thought it was uh, uh, a misplaced bit of dialogue that should have been said earlier. And then once stuff goes down, then it was like not such a good idea. But uh, um, this is not the best episode of the season so far. We're at the midway point. Uh, I thought it was kind of weird, too, that this is kind of a, uh, a bottle episode all, all about this one story. And we've got a greater story arc that's going on. And usually, it, it, you know, this is the section that would be referred to as the second act of their overall season. And you would want to have a more transitional story of what's going on with the plot. So they're really going to have to play catch up in episode five. 
because we're running out of time to build up for the climax so and you have to think about that when you're writing a series you have to think about how you're because each story is its own story but each story also is part of a greater story so you have to make sure that you are writing each chapter to fulfill each part of the the three-act structure most screenwriting is based on is of course three-act storytelling and uh, and of course the story is a, each story is a three-act and each series is a three-act and um, spread out over uh, whatever it was nine ten episodes so chapter four sanctuary is in my opinion not the best of the season so far episode three is standalone the strongest episode of the season but it's still a damn solid story very enjoyable uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, the direction of are you ready for this Bryce Dallas Howard yeah the beautiful daughter of Ron Howard was the director of this episode uh, phenomenal job uh, great cinematography in it great effects uh, everything you expect from a solid Lucasfilm production uh, unlike the, the, the flailing and failing Star Wars saga which like I said I, I think we're gonna see with episode 9 the end of movies as we know it for Star Wars um, I mean it's the end of the Skywalker saga and it's only the end of it because they ruined it it didn't have to be the end of it but uh, Disney wants to stop paying Lucas his percentage is really what it comes down to. it's greed and uh, they want to start doing nothing but original Disney characters and um, uh, and some of the stuff they're doing just doesn't make sense logically so once again this this episode is based on Akira Kurosawa's uh, cinematic masterpiece the seven samurai and in that story it you know it was a period of time when the samurai found themselves uh, without a master and of course a masterless samurai is referred to as a ronin uh, they roam the countryside and uh, they themselves found that they weren't getting much work uh, sometimes it would be mercenary work sometimes it would be, be collecting bounties uh, some of them became brigands uh, that uh, would raid villages for food and sort of what we see here is uh, uh, in the seven samurai is that kind of story because uh, uh, basically the Romans were starving and they had to create employment uh, had to find new ways to avoid starving to death so the this one aging Ronin is approached by uh, villagers and he accepts their request to protect their village from a bunch of brigands and if you don't know what a brigand is they're, they're land pirates or bandits so the brigands are basically um, stealing all their grain and they fear starving to death so the Ronin goes and finds six other Ronin and they go to this village and now that they're employed they are now have a master the village and are samurai again and they're going to protect this village and of course there's a lot of subterfuge within this story uh, like um, the villagers lie to the, the Ronin or the samurai by um, keeping information from them and uh, one of the samurai discovers that they have collected armor from other samurai that they have um, killed and uh, and they get really angry about it and uh, but it comes back at them that the reason these samurai were killed and one of the main villagers that's a, a character in the story you learn was an orphan whose family were killed by samurai and uh, so the samurai at one moment are angry and then they feel ashamed of themselves for what their brothers have done to these farmers uh, in the countryside so they stay and they're going to fight these uh, bandits and they train the villagers to also protect themselves they fortify the village and then this great storm comes and there's this huge battle and one of our favorite characters uh, dies in the story a samurai a lot of heroism a lot of self-sacrifice and in the end you have this uh, toll that is paid and um, uh, it's it's just such a tragic thing and they call it um, uh, Peric victory which is um, where the victory came at such a cost that it's hard to call it a victory and that's when the samurai realized that it's not their victory they lost the samurai lost they won the battle for the villagers but they themselves paid this great price for it and, uh, and it's it's a tremendous film it's one of my favorite films of all time 
and uh, it was really nice to see John Favreau adapt this into a TV show, an episode. Um, almost deserved to have two episodes. It was that good. But once again, they couldn't do that because they've got to continue the plot line, the overall series plot line. And this show didn't, this episode didn't do that. But um, tremendously good episode. Not the best of the season, but really good. Uh, I would give this series a, a, an A minus right now. It could grow to an A plus. And the only reason I give it an A minus is because, like in this episode in particular, there's a couple of flaky moments in it. Um, but it's definitely an A. Uh, I, I give this show a solid score. If I, you know, was doing it on my Couch Potato Critic review, it would definitely be a solid eight out of uh, ten. And the two dropped potatoes would be solely over, uh, you know, some of the writing and some of the missed opportunities within the storytelling. And um, but eight out of ten is still pretty damn good. And I suspect by the end of the series, it'll probably be up to a nine. I don't think it'll, I'll give it a perfect score, but I think this is as close to perfect as we've had so far since Disney bought Lucasfilm. And um, and if John Favreau is kept as showrunner on this uh, with Dave Filoni working with him, uh, this show's going to get better. Uh, I mean, just amazing director. I, I, I've been a fan of John Favreau since 1995, and. I love the guy. I think he's an amazing uh, writer and director. And uh, and he's a good actor, too, on top of that. I mean, look at him in Spider-Man uh, uh, Homecoming and, and Far From Home. Uh, as, uh, what a great actor. And he was great as Foggy in, in Daredevil, uh, the one that everybody hates. Because I hated it, too. It had some problems. But he wasn't it. He was really good as Foggy. So definitely a really good uh, series. Um, I, I'm really looking forward to Episode 5. Hey guys, don't forget to uh, click the subscribe, the bell button if you want to get updates. Post a comment, say something. We love having you watch. Um, I hope we grow our audience a little bigger uh, throughout the, the year. <clears throat> and the only way to do that is if you please spread the word about us. We'd appreciate it. Thanks a lot, man, and see you next episode.